Hello, I'm Cathy Payne. I'm Professor of Real Estate Development here at the Henley Business School at the University of Reading. And by background, I'm an urban geographer and planner. So as you can see, I'm pretty interested in cities, but I'm also interested in a new idea, the megacity region. Half of the world's population is now urban, and more people are living in and moving to cities. Also, large cities are getting bigger, as towns and cities that are physically separated become interlinked by virtual flows of information, but also physical flows of trade, people and goods. And these super cities have been called megacity regions, and they're called an unprecedented urban form. But in reality, it isn't new. The megacity region's been in emergence for decades, and it was first recognised in the United States in the mid-20th century. But what is new is that the megacity region phenomenon is now a worldwide reality, and megacity regions are getting bigger, especially in developing countries. So we're going to look at the example of China, and we're going to look especially at the example of the Yangtze River Delta, which is a very large megacity region with, at its heart, the city of Shanghai. And the population of Shanghai is already 24 million. In China, there are also another two megacity regions of a similar population size. But in China tomorrow, there will be more and bigger megacity regions. So there are positives and negatives to this new urban form. Let's look first at what are the positives of megacity regions. Well, very big cities offer the promise of work and a better life for ordinary people. They're raising people out of poverty, especially in the developing world. Over half of China's population is now urban and 100 to 150 million people is estimated to be middle class. Big cities are dynamic places. They have an intermixing of people and skills and also their centres of culture and education. They have hospitals, schools and all the other facilities that people need to live their daily lives. So actually 440 cities in the world are generating half of global growth. What are the negatives though? Well, development in Mexico regions has impacts on the environment and it contributes to climate change. We're going to turn now to the example of the United States. In the United States, they don't call them Mexico regions, they call them mega regions, and they're certainly mega. They cover 20% of the land area of the United States. They contain two thirds of the population and they generate 70% of GDP. But they also generate, on the downside, extreme commuters travelling over 90 miles a day. And that number has doubled since 1990. Where will it all end? So as we've seen from the two cases so far, megacity regions are like a supersized city, but they're also a complex multi-centre form, which is called polycentric. So in other words, lots of smaller towns and cities make up the megacity region or the super region. Those towns and cities generate crisscross travel of all different kinds. So there's daily commuting as we've seen, but there's much more. There's business travel, there's travel for leisure, there's travel for home deliveries and also freight. And all of that can't be supported efficiently by public transportation in such a complex region. But Contrary to what you might expect, in Europe, policymakers have actually been encouraging these polycentric urban regions as a more sustainable urban form than regions that just have one big compact city, which is called monocentric. So now we're going to look at the example of the Netherlands, and we're going to look in particular at the Randstad region, which is an example of a polycentric urban region. So in other words, it's meant to be more sustainable than regions that have just one big city. And it's been a sustainable planning vision in the Netherlands since 1958. But all is not rosy in this polycentric garden. Why not? If we look at a map of the Randstad region, what we see is very intense cross-cutting movements by car for daily commuting. So actually, contrary to what was expected, the Randstad qualifies as one of Europe's pollution hotspots. Surprising, isn't it? So what can we do about resolving the Mexico region climate change challenge? Obviously, it requires coordinated governance and planning for the spaces that are in between towns and cities that make up this megacity region. But no megacity regions that have been studied so far have actually got joined up policies. 
administrative structures don't map onto these big functional regions. And actually, the functional regions are very liquid. They're changing all the time as patterns of movement and the use of the regions changes. Also, very importantly, there's competition between the various public administration bodies that govern those regions. What do we do about this worldwide phenomenon of a lack of mapping of governance structures and planning onto functional regions which have this climate change problem? So I'd like to leave you with the big question. It's the question that policymakers and planners are asking themselves everywhere in the world which is what do we do, what is the solution to thinking about this climate change challenge of megacity regions? What kinds of new governance structures do we need? Do we need perhaps a type of city mayor who's able to take responsibility for the whole of that functional region? Or do we need new kinds of collaboration, more cooperation between the various local bodies that are responsible for their small patches within that megacity region as it stands? I'd like to leave you with that thought and I'd be really grateful for any kinds of answers that you've got. Everyone would like to hear them.